This is the gastrointestinal applications for advanced diagnostics and procedures. We'll do a presentation overview, which will include brief anatomy and physiology, review of your GI history and physical. We'll look at the diagnostics for each relevant area of the GI tract. We'll discuss abdominal pain. We'll do special considerations, which includes both pediatric and geriatric. We'll talk about a couple of cases, and then we'll talk, um, last part will be about screening for colorectal cancers and hepatitis, along with uh, jaundice classifications. The GI tract is comprised of multiple organs and has two major functions. One is aid, the aid in the retrieval and assimilation of nutrients, and two is the elimination of waste. Now when we look at food digestion, the breakdown initially occurs in the mouth through salivary amylase, and then food passes into the stomach and it's broken down further with gastric acid. As food enters the small intestine, it is then it meets um, bile, which comes from the liver, and the pancreatic enzymes, which come from the pancreas. <clears throat> now, the pancreatic enzymes help assist break the breakdowns of carbohydrates, protein, and fat. They also help with pH regulation. Bile assists in the breakdown of fats and lipids, and your vitamin B12 is absorbed in the ileum. Your large intestines are responsible for the reabsorption of water, and then your normal flora in the small intestines will help the breakdown of amino acids, carbohydrates. There are various disease classifications of the gastro gastrointestinal tract, ranging from impaired digestion and absorption to genetic issues, to cancers, to issues with uh, flow, mesenteric blood flow to the uh, small bowel um, so there are a variety of things to look at. So when looking at common symptoms of the D GI tract, you want to do a very good and thorough history. Make sure you utilize your old cards, getting all the factors that you can to collect good data. You want to know the pain, its location. It's important to know that you have multiple organs in the abdomen. You know, is the pain on the right upper quadrant, left lower quadrant. All of this will help you in determining um, where you need to go with your diagnosis. Um, you want to make sure that we consider is this pain um, a visceral pain versus superficial? Is it referred or intermittent cramping? Um, these are all important factors when assessing um, the abdomen. This is a nice little chart which breaks down um, pain in certain areas and what they may, what they may represent. You also want to get a good past medical history. Has the patient had chronic issues with the abdomen? Is there a known family history, especially when we're looking at cancers um, or other types of GI illnesses? Um, what kind of habits do they have? Do they have a very bad alcohol problem? Do they smoke? Um, these are all important things to consider. Um, medications can play a huge part um, in uh, assessing the abdomen. You know, are they on aspirin? You know, and if they're on aspirin and they have liver issues, um, there could be prolonged bleeding. Are they taking prescriptions that is causing gastric uh, ulcers, such as NSAIDs? Um, again, very important to kind of ask these questions to get good uh, information and in building your differential. When we do our physical exam, we want to look at the entire um, appearance. We want to look at their body habitus. You also want to assess their skin, their hair, and their nails. You know, are they jaundice? Is there edema? Is there dependent edema? Do they have ascites? Um, is the abdomen um, scaphoid? Um, you definitely want to look to see if there's any abnormalities. When we assess for pain, we want to make sure we understand the location, the anatomical structures that surround that location, um, and then think about which differentials um, may be associated with that. So when looking at these next slides, you look at your, your right upper, right lower, left upper, left lower epigastric regions. Um, it can be associated with many of the different diseases listed on this slide and the following slide. As you move through your physical exam, you want to do your quick general inspection. Sometimes you may just look at the abdomen and pick up that there is a humongous hernia or some type of abdominal mass. Then you want to listen for your bowel sounds and listen in all four quadrants. 
you want to do your percussion and then palpate doing light palpation first followed by deep palpation and then try to inspect your organs in small children you can feel the liver edge in children in heart failure and sometimes you can feel the spleen and the kidneys in small babies again doing your quick visual inspection you may note that there's bruising both Gray Turner's and Collins sign are easy to pick up, especially in our trauma patients. So Gray Turner sign would be bruising along the flank, um, on the, either on the right side or the left, and Collins sign is bruising around the umbilicus. When evaluating for ascites, we will review some of the techniques you may be learning in your health assessment course. Um, it's, especially looking at um, or evaluating for shifting dullness and fluid wave. I will post these YouTube links within the module so you can watch these videos um, to follow through uh, on how to test for both shifting dullness and the fluid wave. These next two slides will go through or walk you through the fluid wave test and shifting dullness. Um, the fluid wave test for a positive result, you'll have an impulse that actually transmit through the abdomen and is positive for ascites. And here again are the um, the steps to test uh, the technique to test for shifting dullness um, and how it will confirm the presence of ascites. Again, here are some more technique videos that you can actually um, follow up on, such as rebounding tenderness when we look at appendicitis. Um, at is specifically appendicitis. You can also look at uh, uh, Rofsing sign as well as Sosa sign and the obturator sign. Murphy sign is a test um, to test for um, uh, cholecystitis. Um, and again, um, this is the techniques on how to do that uh, followed with videos. And again, I will post all the videos in the module for you to watch. Now that we've collected a good history and we've done our, our complete and thorough physical exam to evaluate and to look at some of the diagnostic findings for the GI tract, we're gonna move on to some of the laboratory and radiographic tests. When we look at laboratory, some of the key things that we can look at um, to evaluate um, issues within the abdomen would be the complete metabolic profile. We can look at transaminases, both the ALT and the AST, we can look at the alkaline FOS and the GGT to let us know if our liver is functioning properly. When we look at synthetic function of the liver, we want to look at our coagulation um, labs, such as the PTT, PTINR. Also included in the complete metabolic profile is our bilirubin. And bilirubin can let us know how well the liver is functioning um, if you have a patient that's jaundiced. Or, like in the newborn, we check bilirubins to make sure that they're clearing it appropriately and they don't have jaundice of the newborn. Our patients who are alcoholic may be jaundiced because they're in fulminant liver failure, and we may need to evaluate those levels to determine what type of therapies may be needed to, to treat them. Moving on to some of our radiographic studies, we can do a plain KUB, relatively inexpensive, allows us to look at the abdomen and our bowel gas patterns. It helps us differentiate between obstructions or ileus. Um, in small children, um, especially babies, we can look to see if there's any type of uh, necrotizing endocolitis um, with the evaluation of pneumatosis in the abdomen. Um, we can look to see if there's air or fluid filled um, levels in the abdomen as well. So the KUB can give us quite a bit of information. Um, when we look at the abdomen um, with other radiology tests, we can use ultrasound. Um, ultrasound is relatively uh, quick. It's easy. Um, there's little. To, there's absolutely no radiation with it, so it's it's safe to give to mo uh, safe to perform on most patients. It can differentiate between uh, uh, fluids and stones. Um, it can give you evaluations if there is. Um, and appendicitis in the abdomen, as well as gall, uh, gallstones. Um, it can actually assess to see if there are different um, uh, gross tumors in the abdomen as well. One test um, or one form of ultrasound which has become very helpful in the last several years and becoming more prevalent 
not just in emergency rooms and trauma centers, but in the critical care areas, is the FAST exam, which is the focused abdominal um, ultrasound. And it essentially was first developed to look at just the abdomen. You looked at the right upper, right lower quadrants, the right upper and left upper quadrants, as well as the, the super pubic region and retroperitoneal areas, looking for um, fluid collections in the abdomen after traumas. Um, and that's actually expanded um, to look at both the cardiac and the lung fields um, so that you can look to see if there's any type of um, uh, tamponade, um, do you have uh, hemothorax or um, fluid collection in the pleural spaces. Um, so the FAST exam is a huge tool, um, which is very helpful, it's very easy, and it's now becoming a point of care exam for practitioners at the bedside. Now, when we look at the FAST exam, um, it allows us to look at, very, at various um, areas that might be involved in trauma. So when we look at the heart, we'll be able to see the pericardium to see if there's any type of pericardial effusion um, or if the patient is developing tamponade. Um, we can also look quickly to see um, what the function is of the ventricles. In the right upper quadrant, we're going to look at the Morrison's pouch, which is a hepatorenal recess. And if you, get, uh, if you have a liver lack or bleeding in the abdomen, sometimes that pouch becomes accentuated. Um, we can look at the liver tip, um, as well as we can look at the, the lower part of the right thorax. So if the patient does have a hemothorax or has a pleural effusion, you can actually see the lung, um, the distal portion of the lung, just above the diaphragm where the liver sits. On the left upper quadrant, um, we can see your uh, subphrenic space as well as your splenic, uh, your spleen and your kidney. Um, and again, you can look at the left lower thorax to see if there's any fluid collection there as well. And in the pelvis, you can look at the retro uh, vesicle pouch in male patients. And in females, you can look at the rectal uterine pouch, um, known as the pouch of Douglas. When we look at CT scans, again, um, this is another test that will give us more fine detail, um, but it does have its own um, setbacks. Number one, your patient should be NPO when uh, doing abdominal CTs. And in some of our children, sometimes it requires sedation um, to perform an adequate CT because you do need to remain pretty still. The nice thing about CTs is that they're relatively quick, um, but sometimes they may require uh, either oral or IV contrast. So that's another thing to consider, especially if your patient is having some renal insufficiencies. And then again, they would be contraindicated in, in pregnant women because there is a higher dose of radiation that's being um, delivered to the patient. Um, and again, patients uh, that have kidney issues, you need to be very proactive um, to ensure that they preserve their renal function um, after receiving the iodine. MRI again is much more expensive. Um, it does have a pro that there is less radiation, but it does help us get additional information when differentiating between tumors and letting us know whether it's a benign versus a malignant tumor. It may be very helpful in staging certain types of cancer um, and it actually can help complement some of the information that is received from the CT. Um, one thing to remember or one of the absolute contraindications for MRI, the MRI is a big magnet so anything that's metallic, you want to keep away from the big magnet. Um, so your pacemakers would be a contraindication, although there are, there is in development, and I know both Medtronix and Boston Scientific are developing uh, pacemakers that are uh, MRI friendly. Um, anyone who has any devices that have metal in them, um, you definitely want to keep out of the MRI um, exam rooms. Now moving on to some of the specialty diagnostics in, GI, in, in the gastrointestinal system, um, you can do PET scans, um, which will highlight specific areas, um, which can give us information about malignancies or metastasis and can differentiate between um, benign tumors versus malignant tumors. Again, some of your contraindications would be pregnant women or anyone that has any type of allergies to the, the radioactive um, isotrope. Um, there's also mesenteric angiographies where we can look at the, 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 the blood flow that goes to the gut um, and throughout the abdomen. Um, 
the upper GI study can give us a lot of information about uh, GI motility, gastric emptying, mucosal inflammation. Um, it is helpful for us to see if the you know how well the bowel and the stomach are performing. We can also do barium swallows, um, such as looking to see if there's interruption or disruption between the esophagus and the stomach, um, or if there's obstructions there. The barium enema can be both therapeutic or diagnostic. From a diagnostic standpoint, it can let us know if there's any types of obstructions in the large bowel or if there are leaks or fistulas. From a therapeutic standpoint, it can help treat patients with intussusception. The gastric emptying study is a nuclear med test um, that is helpful for evaluating the function of GI upper GI motility. So you can evaluate for gastroduodenal uh, diseases, dumping syndrome, or certain causes of vomiting. The HIDA scan is helpful to evaluate patients um, for cholecystitis, common bile duct, bile duct obstructions, or hepatobiliary function. The esophagastroduodenoscopy, or as simply put, the EGD, allows us to look at the structures of the esophagus, the stomach, and the first portion of the intestines. It allows the provider to go in and remove any types of foreign bodies that may be present. They can obtain biopsies as well as to assess the surrounding tissues in these areas. The ERCP um, is helpful to go um, and assess the biliary um, uh, ducts to see if there's any type of obstruction. Um, this again would also be done in the endoscopy suite. Colonoscopy, again, they would go in through the rectum to evaluate the surrounding structures um, to look for um, any type of polyps or anything that looks cancerous. Um, they can take biopsies at this time for further testing. And it can also be therapeutic for patients that have a sigmoid volvulus. A sigmoid, uh, sigmoidoscopy, again, requires a bowel prep, as I didn't mention previously. For your colonoscopy, you also need a bowel prep. But the sigmoidoscopy, again, would need a bowel prep. It does require sedation. And again, it allows you to do direct visualization of the large intestine to again look for any type of polyps and it also can be therapeutic for a sigmoid volvulus. When screening for colorectal cancer it's important to know that it is the third most common commonly diagnosed cancer in both men and women and it is the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. So it does develop slowly over a long period of time and you should follow the recommendations set for colorectal screening because um, it does affect individuals that are at the highest risk or those highest risk or those over the age of 50 and anyone with a close family history of uh, colorectal cancer. Um, ethnicity, uh, African Americans are at high risk and men are slightly at higher risk than women when developing colorectal cancer. When screening patients that are much older in the age groups such as between 76 to 85 years of age, the screening should be an individual one. You need to take into account the patient's overall health and prior screening history. Adults in this age group who have never been screened for colorectal cancer are more likely to benefit from it. Screening would be the most appropriate among adults who are either healthy enough to undergo treatment for colorectal cancer, for colorectal cancer if it's detected, and do not have a comorbidity condition that would significantly limit their life expectancy. The colorectal cancer uh, screening guidelines are set forth by the American College of Gastroenterology. And in general, they, they recommend colonoscopies every 10 years beginning at the age of 50. Um, but there are some additional screening options, um, looking for a cult blood, a flexible, a flexible sigmoidoscopy every five to 10 years, or CT uh, cholangiography every five years. Um, but again, you would want to make sure that you stay up to date on the screening recommendations to ensure that you're offering proper screening for your patients. 
So looking at big red flags when we look at the acute abdomen, uh, we, we will look at, um, you know, is there pain that awakens the patient from a dead sleep? Does it persist more than six hours and increase in intensity? Does it change location? Does the patient pass out from the pain and have syncope? Is there a, a bl um, bloody emesis, black tarry stools? Um, does the, is there worsening abdominal distension, referred shoulder pain, which we see in patients with cholecystitis? Or does, is there um, referred shoulder to back pain? Uh, where, or does it radiate straight to the back, which could um, reference that the patient may have a pancreatitis or uh, an abdo uh, an abdominal um, aortic aneurysm. Causes of acute abdomen are listed here um, based on the geographical region of the abdomen. In evaluation of the acute abdomen, we know that it's going to be a rapid onset of severe abdominal pain, um, which could be life-threatening, so you want to be able to rule out um, any serious um, sur any serious conditions, number one, and anything that might require surgery, such as an aneurysm, appendicitis, or cholecystitis. Um, be aware that patients that are elderly, um, small children, may have atypical presentations, um, so they may not present with pain, um, or the pain may vary. Um, note that patients that have pain that lasts more than two days is less likely to require emergent surgical intervention. Um, and then note that there is variability amongst the symptoms, um, and they can be very generalized, such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sharp um, or dull, piercing, intermittent pain to the abdomen. Again, when you, when you perform your evaluation of the acute abdomen, you want a very good and thorough um, uh, history uh, of present illness. Again, talking about all your old carts, location, duration, character, um, associated symptoms, aggravating and relieving factors, referred pain, timing, and severity. Um, when we look at some of the specifics, um, you want to look at the characteristics. You know, what type of pain is it? Is it ripping? Is it colicky? Does it radiate to their back? Does it radiate up to the shoulder? Um, again, you know, do they have any other associated symptoms such as constipation or um, vomiting, nausea vomiting? Um, is there any past medical history, any family history? What medications are they taking? Um, also including your review of systems, any type of GU or gynecological issues. Again, when doing your uh, physical exam, um, again, you want to note their general appearance. Um, look at their positioning. Are they guarded? Um, inspect the abdomen. Um, look for any masses or distension, scars evidence of trauma? Is there any bruising? Um, you want to auscultate the abdomen, listening for bowel sounds, bruits. Um, percuss the abdomen. Is it dull or is, does, is there good tympany um, indicating that there's a bowel gas pattern or is there any shifting dullness? When we palpate, how does the patient respond? Are they guarded? Um, do they, is the abdomen soft? Is it hard? Is it rigid? Um, are there any masses? Um, in females, you want to perform a pelvic exam. Um, to rule out any type of ectopic pregnancies. Um, men, you might wanna do a thorough GU exam and also in both men and women, look to see if there's any type of rectal issues um, may prompting for a rectal exam. When we look at our diagnostics for the acute abdomen, we wanna go ahead and start looking at which laboratory studies would be the most helpful. Obviously, if you're worried about any bleeding, we'll check a CBC with a differential, um, especially if we're worried about someone who might be septic. And if there is a sepsis consideration, we may want to go ahead and send some blood cultures and a blood gas. The blood gas may indicate that the patient is uh, metabolically acidotic um, due, to due to the tissue hypoperfusion. Um, and we also may see indications of a rapidly dropping hemoglobin. Also want to look at some of your other um, uh, GI studies, such as the complete metabolic profile that we talked about earlier. You may want to look at the pancreas and check an amylase and lipase looking for pancreatitis. You can check the urine to see if there's any indication of any type of renal issues or um, uh, renal insufficiencies. Um, 
as well as getting a pregnancy test to make sure that the, this isn't some type of ectopic pregnancy. Pediatric considerations, um, it can be very challenging to get uh, or build your differential diagnosis, especially depending on the child's age. If the child is young enough and they can't speak, you don't get very good information and you only have to go by what the caregivers can tell you. Um, older children that can talk may be guarded. They may not want to talk to the healthcare provider. They may be very uncooperative. Um, it's important to make sure that we ask in the history if there's any possibility of um, uh, any accidental ingestions or poisons. And when building your diagnosis, your differential diagnosis, you want to consider um, acute abdomen illnesses that may occur specifically in children, such as intussusception, Meckel's diverticulum, um, mid-gut volvulus, or incarcerated hernias. Some differentials that are not uncommon in children could include colic, UTIs, pelvic inflammatory disease, um, metabolic disorders, constipation, uh, mesenteric adenitis, but it would be uncommon for pediatric patients to have a cholecystitis or pancreatitis. Um, not that it doesn't occur, it's just less likely to occur. Um, internal hernias, urinary calculi, um, Crohn's disease, maybe more so in some of your adolescents versus your kids that are much younger. Again, when we're doing our considerations for doing our diagnostics, um, we want to be cautious um, in doing some of our imaging because we want to reduce the amount of radiation that children um, are exposed to. Um, so x-rays and ultrasounds are most often used. Um, and with ultrasound having no radiation, maybe, per, maybe the preferred exam. Um, CT, one CT in a five-year-old increases, increases their lifetime risk of radiation. Um, 26 per 100,000. So that's significant. So if we can avoid doing CT scans um, or limit it only to the times that we absolutely need to study um, is most beneficial for this population. In children, uh, appendicitis can have an atypical um, signs and symptoms, um, especially if it's um, pelvic or rectrocecal, um, and can be confused with the urinary tract infection. So therefore, the rate of appendix perforation um, in children is relatively high, between 30 and 65 percent. The elderly patient also may present um, with its own challenges, such as having very generalized symptoms. Um, elderly generally tend to lack the ability to mount a fever or have a leukocytosis. Um, they have decreased um, severity of pain. Um, the medications that they're on may also affect how they respond. So for example, if a patient's on a beta blocker, it may blunt the ability for them to become tachycardic. There may also be communication barriers, such as patients that have uh, dementia may not be able to provide information or accurate information. So let's do a case review. Gather the information that we've just reviewed in the previous slides, and let's put it to use to come up with a differential diagnosis. So we have a 45-year-old female that presents with complaints of pain in the right upper quadrant, which began a few hours after eating food at a fish fry about three days ago. It's unrelieved by positioning or antacids. Initially, she was colicky, but now she rates her pain to six out of 10 with no radiation Initial nausea and vomiting, but it's better since only sipping on clear liquids. It's possible that she has a low-grade fever. She's had similar symptoms in the past that resolve without interventions. When we did our review of systems, she's had no change in her bowel or bladder habits. She is sexually active, no vaginal or pelvic symptoms. She has no past medical history. She has had surgery for tubal ligation. Her family history, her parents are both in the 70s, live and well. She has one brother, also alive and well. On your exam, she's uncomfortable appearing non-toxic. She has a, a temp her vital signs show a temperature of 99.9, a, a blood pressure of 150 over 90, a heart rate of 90, respiratory rate of 16. Her BMI is 30. Her last menstrual period was one week ago. She does have uh, pink skin with good turgor and tone. 
Her abdomen is soft, rounded, with active vowel sounds in all four quadrants. Her tenderness um, to deep and light palpation in the right upper quadrant. She has a positive Murphy sign, no rebound. So my question for you, what is your differential? What, diagnos what diagnostics would you like to order? You review your review of systems and you think of cholecystitis, especially with a po positive Murphy sign. But also you may want to think about uh, renal stones or pancreatitis. But when you order your ultrasound of the abdomen in the right upper quadrant, you can clearly see that there is a large stone in the gallbladder. Other studies to consider for your diagnostics would be a CBC with diff, a complete metabolic profile, amylase lipase, a UA. And if your abdominal ultrasound was negative, then you may want to consider a CT scan or HIDA scan. Let's look at another one. Now we have a 15 year old male that presents with his father. He has a history of pain in the peri umbilical region, which began earlier this morning, that is now localized to his right lower quadrant. Never had his pain, this pain before, denies trauma, unsure about low grade fever. Um, his last bowel movement was yesterday. It was formed without blood or mucus. He last ate um, and drank per usual the night before. His pain has increased to an 8 out of 10, and he began vomiting, which looks bilious in uh, presentation, on his way to the hospital. His pain radiates into the right testicular area and is aggravated by cough. On your review system, there's no weight loss, never sexually active. On your physical exam, you have a young male that's uncomfortable guarding his abdomen. He has a, low, he has a temperature of 100.4, a blood pressure of 130 over 80, a heart rate of 90, respiratory rate of 16, and his BMI is 22. Also on exam, you notice that his uh, buccal, um, his buccal mucosa is moist. He's got good skin turgor and slightly, um, he has slight pallor. His abdomen is soft, non-distended with decreased bowel sounds throughout. Tenderness to light and deep palpation of the, over the right left, uh, excuse me, over the right lower quadrant with rebound, positive Rob Singh's sign, obturator heel strike, and Sosa sign. Dullness to percussion. Gastrointestinal bilateral testes descended, non-tender, non-enlarged. So what differentials would you come up with? Testicular torsion, renal calculi, maybe appendicitis? What diagnostics would you order? You could consider a CBC with diff a complete metabolic profile or UA. And when you look at your radiology studies you could do, you can do abdominal ultrasound or CT scan if it was um, undetermined on the ultrasound. Here we have ultrasound images, both in the long axis and short axis view, which are um, positive for appendicitis. The arrows indicate where the inflammation of the appendix is located. Now we'll move on to bilirubin. Um, it comes in two forms, both conjugated and unconjugated. The unconjugated bilirubin is insoluble in water and is carried by albumin. Conjugated bilirubin is soluble in water and eliminated in the intestines and urine. We test bilirubin um, with the total and direct. Total bilirubin is your direct plus your indirect bilirubin. Direct bilirubin, which is also your conjugated bilirubin, um, is seen in elevated biliary obstruction, sepsis, hepatocellular injuries, hepatitis, liver infiltrates. Your indirect uh, or your unconjugated bilirubin um, is seen in hemolysis. Um, it's decreased in hepatic clearance, some genetic disorders. Patients that are at risk for issues are newborns, especially if there's an excess of bilirubin where they can develop an encephalop encephalopathy, which is also known as cronicterus. This chart gives you a nice breakdown of bilirubin metabolism. 
As mentioned before, bilirubin is the breakdown of red blood cells or the metabolism of the red blood cell at the end of its lifespan. So after 120 days, the hemoglobin is broken down into both heme and globin. The globin converts to amino acids. The heme is broken down further into iron and bilirubin. It's later then uh, broken down. And, and then initially is the unconjugated and then converts to the conjugated form. So why test the bilirubin? What well, it gives us diagnostic information to test to see if there's any liver cirrhosis, hepatitis, gallstones. In neonates, we're testing to make sure that it's cleared because again, if it builds up, they can develop kernicterus. Um, we use it to evaluate hemolytic, hemolytic anemias um, and sickle cell disease. When the patients with sickle cell disease are in crisis, they can ha have excessive RBC destruction and increase in bilirubin levels. Again, when we talk about jaundice in the newborn, the unconjugated bilirubin is increased in the physiologic jaundice of the newborn and hemolytic disease of the newborn. Conjugated um, is less common from neonatal hepatitis and biliary atresia. And when we look at the overall causes of increased bilirubin in the blood, it can be from an increased bilirubin production, a decrease in hepatic uptake, such as some of our drugs, right? A decrease in conjugation um, based on certain illnesses, such as Gilbert's disease. In the evaluation of jaundice, we look at our bilirubins greater than 2.5 to 3 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, first signs of, of, of an elevated bilirubin um, is sometimes seen in jaundice. Um, findings can be uh, icterus, which is a yellow discoloration of the sclera, jaundice, which is a yellow discoloration of the skin, and bilirubin urea, which is a golden brown uh, discoloration of the urine. When we look at some of the causes of jaundice, when we have uh, prehepatic, it can be from hemolysis or jaundice of the newborn. Uh, we can have hepatic, which is hereditary uh, cholestatic syndromes, hepatocellular dysfunction, such as cirrhosis or hepatitis. When we look at post-hepatic, um, we could be looking at some pancreatic cancers, which are blocking the biliary outflow tracts. These next two slides are nice little charts um, that you might want to keep uh, available when you're looking at um, jaundice, just as we described with the nice breakdown of what could be the cause and what could be some of your diagnostic findings. Ascites is essentially accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. We talked about how to do our assessments of ascites. Um, we look for signs of um, uh, inverted umbilicus, bulging flanks, tympani at the top of the abdominal curve, fluid wave, or shifting dullness test. Additional findings in chronic liver disease may present with systemic estrogen levels increasing, um, which can promote uh, breast development in male patients, also known as gynecomastia spider angiomata, which is dilated arterioles, most often visible in the skin of the upper chest, and testicular atrophy. In the lower extremity, we could see impaired synthesis of protein and albumin. We can have a lower intravascular oncotic pressure, which results in leakage of fluid into the soft tissues. Um, and the lower extremities is more prevalent. And now we're moving on to the last section, which is hepatitis. There are multiple forms of hepatitis. We can have alcohol-induced hepatitis, autoimmune, and then the viral uh, forms of hepatitis, which is hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Alcoholic hepatitis, when doing your history and physical, you will find that they have a history of heavy alcohol use, they may have history of past hepatitis, hepatitis C or chronic hepatitis B infections. They may present with a history of esophageal varices, right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, 
on your physical exam again you would have they may be confused with an altered mental status they can present with gynecomastia lower extremity edema lower extremity lower extremity edema they may have ascites your laboratory findings there's a nice little chart here when you look at your transaminases where they may be altered um, expect initial abnormal lfts that may normalize low albumin low platelets abnormal coagulation studies hyponatremia uh, liver transaminases are useful biomarkers in liver injury The child pew score for cirrhosis mortality allows you to estimate the, the severity of cirrhosis and gives clinicians the opportunity to do prognosis related on strength of treatment and the necessity for liver transplantation. And here are some values for you to evaluate. Autoimmune hepatitis can have an insidious onset and can become a chronic issue for patients. Um, patients that have that are at risk are those with specific illnesses such as celiac disease, Crohn's disease, uh, thyroid issues, Graves disease, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis. In your subjective history, um, you may find that the patient may have had recent viral illnesses or toxic drug exposures. Um, they may complain of nausea, vomiting, joint pain, loss of appetite, jaundice. On your physical exam, you may find that they're otherwise a healthy person who, who exhibits spider angiomas, bruises, striacne. Um, they may have the heritsuism, uh, hepatomegaly, and ascites. Here you'll see, again, some of the very similar elevated lab studies or altered lab studies that you would see with someone with hepatitis, such as your elevated bilies, your prolonged bleeding times, elevated GGTs, and transaminitis. When screening for hepatitis, we have to remember that there's different uh, causes such as alcohol abuse, different diseases, bacterial or viral infections. We know that there's different modes of transmission. We know that it can affect the liver differently. Um, there are vaccines for both hepatitis A and hepatitis B, but not for others. Um, hepatitis C um, can be, uh, hepatitis B and C can both begin as acute infections, but in some people, the virus in the body results in chronic disease over a longer period of time um, and over uh, long-term liver problems. Now let's look at the different types of hepatitis. Hepatitis A is a worldwide issue, as you can see from the map to the right on this slide, that a very large portion of the world has a very high or medium high risk of hepatitis A. It's transmitted through the oral fecal route. Um, it does have about a 30 day incubation period. There is a vaccine available, especially for those parts of the world that have high prevalence. Um, patients may have a history of anorexia, nausea, nausea, vomiting, malaise, and may have a history of traveling to some of these endemic parts of the world. On your physical exam, you may find fever, an enlarged and or tender liver, jaundice. Your lab findings may find uh, abnormal uh, amino transferase, a low or normal white blood cell count, and you may want to order for further diagnostics an anti-HAV uh, immunoglobulin, an anti-HAV uh, immuno or IgM and IgG, as well as screening for other forms of hepatitis such as B and C. Hepatitis B is transmitted through blood and body fluids. Um, it can be spread during exposure to blood and body fluids. Unprotected, unprotected sex, unsafe medical procedures uh, through a cut or shearing uh, uh, IV drug needles. Most commonly it is spread um, from mother to child during childbirth. All uh, those that are at risk, uh, uh, chronically elevated um, ALTs, person with multiple sex partners, IV drug users, inmates, dialysis patients, patients receiving blood transfusions,
Hepatitis C is also transmitted in the blood, in the blood or body fluid. Um, again, is commonly spread during childbirth from the mother to the child. Um, people that are at highest risk are those with HIV infection, um, multiple sexual partners who are Hep C positive, uh, dynamic history of STDs with multiple sex partners, IV drug use, history of blood transfusions or organ transplant on or before 1992, uh, those hemophilia patients, again, receiving multiple blood transfusions, um, dialysis patients. Um, it, the virus itself is RNA stranded with seven genotypes. Um, it does have an incubation period of about six to seven weeks. There is no vaccine available. Um, the history include mild symptoms often found by labs, positive drug and high-risk sexual history. Um, they may present with fever, enlarged or, and or tender liver and jaundice. Um, and there are additional um, anti-Hep C, um, HCV RNA for PCR, quantitative with genotyping studies. And you, again, you want to screen for other forms of hepatitis, such as hepatitis A and B. Here again is a nice little comparison chart of the different forms of hepatitis, identifying their types of symptoms, their routes of transmission, classifications, genotype, viral antigens, and incubation periods. So in summary, in review of the GI system, it's important to get a complete and thorough history and physical. The information that you gather is going to allow you to identify your differential diagnosis. It's going to allow you to build which diagnostic testing is going to be important. A very good clinical exam with good exam skills is going to, again, further allow you to pro pro provide and perform the appropriate diagnostic test. Knowing what to rule in and what to rule out is also going to be helpful. And again, you want to collaborate. You're not working in isolation. You're not going to be working by yourself. Utilize the resources around you, whether that be a collaborating physician, a referral service such as uh, GI, labs, radiology, uh, radiographic images, um, and other studies to help best allow you to make a confirmed diagnosis, or at least allow you to rule out those things that you're most concerned about. We covered a lot of information in this lecture, um, so please, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you.